young Earth creationism is precluded entirely by dozens upon dozens of well-known facts of the natural world. From the radioactive decay law, the speed of light, and the nature of the geologic column, to the statistics that surround common ancestry, the fossil record, and our genetic relationship to the rest of the primates, mammals, and really just the entire tree of life. But so frequently I encounter what I am calling bite-size busts, aspects of STEM fields that entirely preclude young earth creationism that aren't typically talked about, but bust hard nevertheless. Be it geology, anthropology, astronomy, or physics, here we discuss the minutia of fields that leave young earth creationism out in the cold. If you're new to the channel, don't forget to subscribe if you like this kind of content, leave a like and maybe a comment, and if you feel like supporting the channel in other ways, you can check out my Patreon, my PayPal, or stores. Today, we will be performing a case study on Dinosaur National Monument, and we will discover how this one single location manages to preclude young earth creationism. Dinosaur National Monument is a part of the Morrison Formation, which is a widespread stratum of soft and colorful mud and siltstone interspersed with sand. The Morrison Formation sprawls across much of the western United States, from Arizona and New Mexico all the way up to southern Canada. This formation is Upper Jurassic Rock and ranges from 100 to 800 feet in thickness, and it is known for its rich dinosaur deposits, including those found at the Dinosaur National Monument. Numerous near-complete sauropod skeletons have been unearthed at DNM, and today visitors can find a massive table of sandstone with over 2,000 large bones on display. As you examine the photos of the site, you'll probably notice that the bones appear to be in a large jumble. Can you hear the flood geologists salivating yet? As we all know, young earth creationism requires a spontaneous creation event some 6,000 years ago, as well as a global flood event some 4,400 years ago that is responsible for all layers of the geologic column from the Cambrian to the Cretaceous, as well as their fossils, every impact event or mass extinction signature within said layers, the current positioning of the continents, the state of decay of all radioactive elements, and finally, the various levels of diversity for all extant life. As we have mentioned in previous bite-sized busts, these conditions are considered by many flood geologists to be the best possible explanations for these fossil graveyards like Dinosaur National Monument. They propose, essentially, that the global flood would be the only way to get this mass annihilation of life and tear it apart, leaving it jumbled together in a near-instantly buried uh, cluster of biomass. Of course, they also claim that the same flood is responsible for the preservation of hundreds of thousands of articulated organisms, including gentle, delicate insect wings, but we'll touch more on that later. The conventional explanation for this particular fossil graveyard at DNM is that it is simply the result of an ancient river system that is known to track across this area and beyond. Just as we see occasionally today, harsh storms cause rivers to overflow and increase in speed, carrying animals and debris swept into them downstream. Characteristics of river bends can cause catches and collections of large animal remains. This explains not only the fossil graveyard, but unlike a global flood, it also explains why there is a bias towards large animals in this single location. But let's hear the creationist case, and then we will examine its lethal flaws. The nature of the sauropods at Dinosaur National Monument is certainly that of a dinosaur graveyard, but creationists, as is unfortunately typical, manage to misconstrue the majority of the story. You may have heard of old school creationist Henry Morris. I don't know who that is and I don't care to find out. Morris quotes Edwin Colbert in his book Men and Dinosaurs, saying, The concentration of fossils was remarkable. They were piled up like logs in a jam. Unquote. This quote was actually Colbert referring to an entirely different location, the Howe Quarry. I expect nothing, and I'm still let down. Fortunately, at least modern creationists are referring to the proper site. 
William Hoche and Stephen Austin, for instance, find that Dinosaur National Monument provides eloquent witness to the catastrophic nature of the Noachian deluge. They then provide a list of six facts that they feel elucidate the true nature of Dinosaur National Monument. Let's hear these facts now. Fact number one is that the fossil shells of the freshwater clam Unio are more common than dinosaur bones are at the site. These shells are often disarticulated and show signs of transport, and the ones that are articulate appear to have been quickly buried. Fact number two, the mud of the Morrison Formation, and thus Dinosaur National Monument, is volcanically altered ash. They propose that such ash was likely a part of a catastrophic worldwide event of volcanism at the time of the flood. Fact number three is that the entire assemblage is not an in-situ environment, and most, if not all, remains show signs of transport in the form of abrasion. Fact number four, Hoche and Austin point out that the dinosaur remains are separated into three distinct horizons, the sand grains of which are composed of altered tuff and chert. Thus, they propose volcanic mud flows triggered by the global flood and global volcanism events are responsible. Fact number five, large herbivores require abundant plant matter, but such food sources are not found in situ at the site, so what on earth were the sauropods eating? And fact number six, they note that such mass fossil graveyards are found in over 20 different locations, and they find that no explanation exists to explain all of them. Let's explore the issues one by one. Fact one is an interesting one to bring up as it is highly problematic for creationists. Not only are there innumerable freshwater clams found at the site, but many other strictly freshwater prehistoric organisms. Freshwater snails, ostracods, crayfish, and catus fly larval casings are found. Larger ancient animals too can be seen at DNM, turtles, crocodiles, frogs, pterosaurs, lizards, and archaic mammals as well. Freshwater fish, including lungfish, are also somewhat common. But not a single saltwater organism, not one planktonic microorganism, is found at this site. It is allegedly a middle or even upper level flood deposit well into the half year of the catastrophic event. As such, knowing the nature of how salt and freshwater mix, marine and freshwater life should be found unilaterally sloshed together. But we don't find one single saltwater life form. Fact number two on its own is not problematic. Local catastrophes in the form of volcanism have been appreciated by paleontologists and geologists for decades, and within the Morrison Formation, volcanism of the Rockies is also well understood. But examining that geochemistry that shows up again in fact four reveals a much deeper problem, so we will tackle them both at once. The volcanogenic soil invoked by these creationists has colored banding, indicating fossil soil horizon that are composed of well-preserved calcretes that require arid conditions to form, not even close to possible underwater. Fact three also presents a preclusion to their own proposition as abrasion due to water transport is indeed common among the dinosaur remains, but many of these bones also display sub-aerial exposure patterns in the form of weathering, and only on the top half. This means that the bones were frequently deposited during floods, lodged in the mud, and when the waters receded, the normally dry environment returned and allowed the exposed bone to be weathered by the elements until another flood showed up to finish the job. This is further supported by the absence of lightweight bones, which, if not buried on the initial deposit, would have been inevitably swept downstream when the rains returned. Fact five is simply out of date. Dozens of types of Mesozoic flora are found at DNM, from ginkgos to ferns to cycads to conifers and horsetails. Finally, fact six is just false. Not only does an explanation for the state of fossils at DNM exist, but it is reflected in the dozen or so other fossil graveyards. I actually covered the nature of one of them, the Cleveland Lloyd Dinosaur Quarry, in another video. None of these supposed global flood calling cards seem to pan out. They lack global flood signals and are chock full of periodic local flood geochemical and geomechanical signs. 
Both the conventional science explanation and that of the Noachian deluge expect to see dinosaur bones with transport wear. But in the case of the Noachian deluge, in stark contrast to the conventional and empirically sound answer, we don't see an explanation for how a single process, that being the global flood, resulted in both concreted assemblages of dinosaur bones in all stages of articulation and the deposition of slow-precipitating, fine alkaline sediment packages with exclusively freshwater aquatic life. And given this is Jurassic strata, this would had to have happened in the middle of the flood, with volatile waters both before and after its deposition. For over a mile below the Morrison Formation, strata of the early Jurassic spans to the Cambrian, and above, the Cretaceous Shale dominates. How do you suppose we get fine-grained volcanic chert below shale. The only explanation is time and a changing environment. Responses to this bust will, as always, essentially boil down to invoking never-before-seen processes to explain why there is such a lack of marine fossils at Dinosaur National Monument. You'll probably also hear a lot of but 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 uniformitarianism, as if modern geology does not believe in local catastrophes, you know, those things that we see like all the time today in the case of mudslides, hurricanes, tidal waves, uh, and volcanic eruptions. And as usual, simply asking for empirical support in the form of a study or a paper or a mechanism will always end in a pivot to a different topic. And so it seems that the case study of Dinosaur National Monument has indeed precluded Young Earth creationism. Join me next time, my gentle and moderate apes, for another bite-sized bust to some big pseudoscience. Please,